Hello, welcome to Tea with Mali. We are here today with Mike Bird. He is the executive producer of ProView. Thanks so much, Mike, for being here. Thank you. Thank you for, for all For all the years that we've known each other, you're actually on my show. This is really cool stuff. I can't believe it. I can't believe you would actually invite me to your show. Tell me and tell the audience what led you into sports and broadcasting because I think that's a great beginning stage of this interview because everything else you do really revolves around that. Well, one of the things that uh, you learned about me very early on is that I have a lot of stories. So this story is um, pretty interesting in that I thought that you know years ago I was going to become like most young black you know high schoolers. I thought I was going to be this college basketball phenom and then eventually do something in the professional ranks. And that obviously did not happen. <laughs> um, and uh, I remember trying to walk on, uh, I, I, I grew up a portion of my um, uh, teenage years in Milwaukee. Okay. And I went to school academically at uh, Market University. E pluribus una. Uh, for you Latin boss, that's from many, there is one. Um, and Al McGuire, who was a coach at the time, um, said that, uh, he took one look at me and said, son, you're not gonna make this team, not now, not ever, not never. Whoa. My advice to you is that you should go and get a job when your academic career is done. So, you know, I mean, I was crushed, but that was really the best advice that anyone has ever given me, ever. He made a contact for me at a classical music station, WEZW, um, and introduced me to um, a good friend of his. His name was Glenn Redd, okay. R-E-D-D. -D. And um, he told him that it, he wanted to give me a job. And so I never interned. You know, I think the common fallacy in, a, a, in this business, in the broadcasting business, is that you have to go to Podunk, Idaho, in order to get a job. Well, that's not true. Uh, I never interned not one day in my life. I, I was a high-paid gopher. <laughs> you know, I got everything from coffee to tea to you name it. Um, but I learned the business. You know, I learned how to copyright. You know, and at that point in time, it was, you know, you, you know it was basically typing on a, hand, on a, on a handheld typewriter mm -hmm. and um, you know, I learned how to splice copy, I learned how to splice tape, you know, and I learned how to, you know, to, to do all of those things fundamentally that you need to do in radio in order to be, you know, successful and have a career. Right. And uh, I went from there to uh, um, WNOV, which was an acronym at the time for the Negro's Own Voice. The sister station in Chicago was WVON, many of our of your viewers out there will probably know about WVON. WVON was the actual opposite of WNOV. It was the voice of the Negro, mm -hmm. owned by the same guy. Um, and so that's where I started cutting my teeth in radio and the rest is history. I've been in this market for, since 1982, dating myself, since 32 years. Um, I've worked in um, Kansas City, I've worked in Denver, and I worked here, and of course I worked in Milwaukee, Chicago. All right. So when was your uh, first memory, if you can recall it, um, when you knew that going in the direction of sports, meaning that you would be surrounding yourself with sports, being um, around it, learning about it, I know that you played it, but did that start when you were very, very young? Did that happen later when you were in high school? Like what led you to? Well, I've always been around, I've always had the good fortune of being around um, athletes. You know, I mean, in, in, when I was growing up in school, it, there were really only two kinds of guys. There were nerds, and there were, you know, your sports guys. Right. I, I was on the sports end of that. And, um, and we're, there really wasn't any cross-pollination of sports and nerds. We really didn't hang around nerds, and nerds really didn't hang around us. That's just the way it was. We wouldn't have been friends. That's right. <laughs> Well, <laughs> but we're friends now. So, um, so I always had the good fortune of being around uh, sports and being around, you know, basketball guys and football guys. And and when I went to WNOV, uh, one of the first assignments was to cover the Milwaukee Bucks, uh, and, um, and and so that was a gem of an, of an assignment right. because at the time, um, uh, Lou Alcindor, uh, who later became Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. 
uh, was uh, he started his career as a Milwaukee Buck. And, and not so coincidentally, my high school, St. John's Cathedral, which was on the east side on the lakefront in Milwaukee, uh, was where a lot of the athletes used to live. They used to live in a section of, of town not far from the high school called Juno Village. Okay. And so they used to jog past my high school every morning. So I used to see Kareem and uh, Oscar Robertson and Wally Jones and Lucius Allen and all these guys that were at the time back in the 70s. I mean, these were big names. I mean, Kareem yes. is a, yes. you know, I mean, as a legend. A legend. Yeah. So um, I got a chance to cover the Bucks uh, and be courtside. I was one of, at the time, only two black sports reporters in all of Milwaukee. And I was, at the time, I was 20, uh, 19, 20 years old. So, uh, I mean, for me to be able to sit courtside uh, and watch these games and then cover these games and then go into the locker room and do the interviews, I mean, I was a paid member of the working press at 19 years old. Wow. That doesn't happen. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So I have a glass of wine here. Oh, yes. Wine this with, is wine with Mike, by the way. Wine with Mike. I'm going to stick with my tea mm -hmm. <laughs> for now. Mm -hmm. mm. There we go. There you go. Salud. So, you, did you enjoy the behind the scenes stuff as a broadcaster? I do want to talk about that because we have all kinds of viewers that watch the show. We have people who are really uh, aspiring to look for a new career, transitioning, maybe start their own thing. But I want to talk about the real deal. We have this idea of what it's like to be in this career or that career, be on TV and television. But we don't always get the real story. Right. So what was it like for you? Well, I mean, it was great. I mean, it, it, it was euphoric. Um, as I said, I got a chance to cover these guys at a young age. You know, when you're, when you're in the locker room uh, as a 19, 20-year-old punk kid, and you're in a professional environment with guys that, that are known all over the country, in some cases all over the world, right. I mean, how big of a thrill is that? Yeah. And then to be able to go back, you know, to the radio station, and, and cut up the tape of the interview that you did, you know? I mean, that's a real big deal, yeah. you know, to be able to then broadcast that, you know, in front of all these people. So you're not only cutting up the tape and you're reviewing the interview, but now you're talking about the interview that you did yourself. I mean, it's, I mean yeah. it doesn't get any better than that. A lot of pride and all that hard work. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Which it is a lot of hard work. I yeah, mean, yeah, you did, you had, like you said, you were a gopher and you had to do all these things and learn the ropes. And it wasn't something that happened overnight. No. So. No. So I cut my teeth, you know, uh, um, you know, I mean, just immediately involved in radio and covering not just sports guys, but uh, you know, I did my fair share of ambulance chasing and <laughs> and uh, you know, uh, one of the first assignments I had in the news department, uh, I worked um, after WNOV. I worked for a station, an all news station called W-O-K-Y. I don't you remember all these. I re yeah, well, you know I have a total recall, right? Uh, I work for a station, W-O-K-Y, um, and uh, all new station, and one of my first assignments for them was I had the morgue beat. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when you go down to uh, the morgue, the city morgue, and you got to do reporting on dead cadavers, and what? how they, oh yeah, I did all of that. Oh uh, yeah. Explains a lot. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, well, well. That's a whole other story. But yeah, I mean, I've seen some. I've seen some pretty grisly things in the morgue. You know, I mean, I've seen bullet holes in bodies, and I've seen yeah, it's, I've seen toe tags, and I mean, a whole shot. I mean, fresh, like a day after they come that's to the morgue. Right? Yeah. So I, I, I've, I've, I've covered a lot, and I've done a lot. I've, you know, had experiences that. Um, uh, that most people wish they, they had in yeah. this business. Yeah. Well, let's fast forward and then you can fill in the gap in between. Mm -hmm. You are now the executive producer for ProView. Mm -hmm. First, let's talk about what ProView is, and then I definitely want you to go back and um, tell us how you actually met with your partner, how you guys got connected, and how this whole beautiful thing came about, um, this hugely successful thing. Um, so, what is ProView? ProView is a media platform, media company, uh, we do six different things. Uh, we have our radio show on ESPN mm -hmm. 980 in this marketplace. 
Uh, we have our TV show on MASSIM, which is an acronym for the Mid-Atlantic Sports Network. On most networks or most stations here, it's on Comcast. Mm -hmm. uh, we're all over the country on direct TV. Uh, we have a magazine. Am I, can I get the magazine? Yes, get magazine? your magazine. <laughs> Plug it. Magazine. Which camera are we? With this camera <laughs> yes. right here? This is the magazine. <laughs> this is the magazine. Yeah, we're, uh, this is uh, actually hot off the press. The ink is still dry, not even dried. It's on my hands. Um, but Proview the magazine is... Um, it's um, just, I mean, it's really exploded at a time where, you know, magazine and newspapers are going that way in terms of readership. You know, we're going the opposite way. So radio, TV, magazines, our website, which is DocWalker.com. Um, our biggest thing uh, are the events that we do, networking events every four to six weeks. Um, uh, those are just huge. Yes. And then uh, what I'm most proud of is uh, the golf tournament, the ProView Celebrity golf tournament, mm -hmm. Doc Walker Proview Celebrity Golf Tournament. And uh, this past May 5th uh, was our second annual event, and we raised $129,000, one day event, for the National Kidney Foundation. Wow. Um, kidney Foundation is close to my heart because my mom passed away from yes. kidney complications. Yes, I remember. Um, we only have a few uh, nonprofits that we deal with, and one of the other ones that we have is the Alzheimer's Association, mm -hmm. which is close to Doc's heart because his mother-in-law has the initial stages of uh, dementia. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're, 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 we're trying to do something good in the community. One of the things that I always tell people is, particularly corporations and companies, is whatever you do, just do something good mm -hmm. in the community. Right. And we really believe in that. And so when you tie all the six events together, what is it all for? What do you want people to believe in when they think of Doc Walker, you, and ProView, and the whole team that you have that make this happen? Well, it's all for money. <laughs> money! We are not in the nonprofit business now. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, we're very much capitalists. Right. You know, no question about it. But, you know, there is a, another side to us. You know, we, um, you know, it's very difficult. I make no bones about it. And if Doc were here, he'd say the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's very difficult for two I was going to say two young black men, but that's not the case anymore. Um, it's tough for young two... Young at heart. Young at heart, yes. Uh, it's tough for two black men to make it in this world, and especially in an ultra-competitive business like the radio and TV industry. And I'm proud to say that we're the second longest running locally produced uh, TV show in this marketplace. You know, there's really only us and It's Academic that's been on longer. Wow. That's locally produced. Right. I mean, it's just, it's been a, it's been an amazing ride. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, you and I have known each other a long time and you were a great supporter of, yes. of us way back when. Yeah. So, you know, without people like you, we wouldn't be here having this conversation right. today. Yeah. So it's tough. Every day is a different day. Um, you know, there's always a mountain to climb. There's always a hill to climb. Um, there's always a new adventure. Um, but at the end of the day, it's very rewarding um, because we know we've helped someone. Mm -hmm. um, the, the concept of ProView, um, and, and, and I don't know, we're going to hopefully talk about the origin of ProView. Oh, but, yes, definitely. But, um, you know, in the radio business, you could be at a top flight radio station in this marketplace or any other top 10 market, and you could probably command for an eight week schedule 100 grand mm -hmm. without question. You come back to the client and you say, okay, well, Molly, Eight weeks is done, what do you think? Right. And you say, well, you know, Mike, I think the spot sounded okay, but I really don't know if it hit the mark. And you either say, okay, well, you know, you can either re-up or yeah. not. What we've done is we've taken the under-promise and over-deliver axiom, and we've taken it to a new level. And we said, okay, how about if we offer our clients, our sponsors, um, six month to a year contracts. Let's minimize the risk in terms of their cash outlay. Mm -hmm. I don't think that we have anyone that's on, on our on our roster of client list that spends more than $25,000 a year with us. Okay. So our average is right around $7,500 to $8,000. Okay. okay. But we have a lot of clients. And so what we've done is we said, okay, we'll do longer schedules, Minimize the risk, 
um, put the Washington Redskins, you know, element behind it. Right. You know, it's the colors, the burgundy and gold. Uh, and Doc is the ambassador for that team. Yes. You know, and um, and personally, because you're, you know, an owner, small to medium sized business mm -hmm. is where we live. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and and so are we. And so we stand behind what we sell. And it's been very, very successful because people don't have $100,000 to put into radio or TV or $20,000 a week to put into the Washington Post or $20,000 a month to put into Washingtonian. But they can take a fraction of that money and they can utilize it with us and they can get a big bang for their buck. Right. So tell our viewers, especially those that don't follow sports and football, mm -hmm. who Doc Walker is and then tell us how you met each other. Mm. <coughs> mm. Well, let me just say first that you can be the greatest salesperson in the world. If your product sucks, you ain't going nowhere. Right. Okay? Yeah. Conversely, you can be the greatest talent in the world. If no one's banging the streets, you know, chances are your talent's going to be wasted. Right. And so we have the perfect combination of church and state. Mm -hmm. You know, Doc does what he does. I do what I do. We come together and we make beautiful music together. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be the first to tell you that, uh, you know, my partner, Doc Walker, uh, played in the, in the you know, National Football League 10 years, uh, Washington Redskin, although his first team was the Cincinnati Bengals. Um, came to Washington in 1980, and uh, he's, a, uh, he's a skin through and through. Uh, Super Bowl champion, played on the 82 team. Um, he played on the 83 uh, 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 NFC championship team. As well, they got beat by the Raiders in that year, in that Super Bowl year. He didn't want me to talk about that too much, but uh, but he is just—he's a remarkable talent. I think news or sports. I think he's the best talent, news or sports-wise, not just in this marketplace. I think in the entire East Coast, he's phenomenal. He's phenomenal because he's bigger than life, literally and figuratively. Yes, he is. He's he's he's. Uh, a guy that business savvy, there's nobody better. He looks decent. Mm -hmm. I temper <laughs> my words and be kind. <laughs> you know, he, he's, he, he's, he's sharp, speaks the king's English. He is very credible. He's got tons of integrity uh, and people love him. He's the same guy having a shot in a beer at the Capitol Grill as he is at a $2,500 plate dinner at the Washington Hill. Who better to represent on the street than Doc Walker? Mm -hmm. I mean, this guy, I mean, he's phenomenal. He's an even better business partner than he is a, a best friend. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, 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 I mean, I, you'll never get me to say anything bad <laughs> about, about Doc. He's, uh, he's fabulous, he's, a, he's one of a kind. So when did you guys meet? I used to be a frequent caller on his radio show okay. under the pen name of Mr. Chicago. <laughs> I did not know that. And um, we found that uh, we had such a good time on the air that uh, we met off air. Uh, our families had a lot of commonality and his wife, my wife, went to Hampton. Okay. Uh, at the time, Hampton Institute, now it's Hampton University. Okay. And uh, we just had a lot in common. And so, uh, we just kind of, as a, in the street vernacular, we just kind of kicked it. Right. And, uh, you know, we, we both love cigars, we both love good scotch, um, and, uh, and we had a lot in common. So we just struck up a friendship. And then, uh, lo and behold, we, uh, we, uh, we, we started talking about this business concept called ProView. And at the time, uh, March, of, March 22nd, 2002, 9.37 in the morning, I walked into my office at ABC. I was working for ABC Radio at the time. And uh, I just said, I can't do this one more doggone day. That's, doggone is not the word I use. <laughs> but um, I just said, I just can't do this anymore. And I was being paid a boatload of money, but the scales of my life were like that. Right. So you were burnt out. Yeah. I mean, I got mm -hmm. beepers and pagers and boom, boom, boom. And, I, you know, clients. And, and it just, I was living to work and not working to live. Right. And that lifestyle sucks. Yeah. So I said, I'm out. 
It wouldn't matter if they paid me $3 million. I'm out. Mm -hmm. So I went to my office, talked to uh, Doc, and called him up and said, hey, what do you know us for? I said, ah, you know, just getting ready. And I said, well, you know this concept we've been talking about, Provium? I think today's the day we're going to get it launched. Mm -hmm. And that morning, we launched our business plan, and uh, we literally wrote our business plan on a napkin. The next week, we formed our LLC, and away we went, and we never looked back. Wow. How many years ago was that? That was 12. Wow. August okay. 9th, so it's in a few weeks, August 9th of 2002, mm -hmm. we went on the air for the first time. Wow. That just doing the math, we then met nine years ago. Mm-hmm. Because you guys were just a couple years, a little over a couple years in, and then you, then that's when we met, and that's, that's when right. I got involved in ProView. That's right. Yeah, and I remember when the ba this baby was born, and that's been a, a while now too. That used to be a years. pamphlet. Yep. Yeah, it's, that's what I was noticing earlier. It's so thick now. So congratulations yeah. on that. That's a big deal. Well, you know, we're quick studies. You know, we, we know we'll never be, uh, you know, close to the Washingtonian standard, or maybe even Viva Vienna, or Viva Tyson, mm -hmm. whatever they call it. But, you know, we know that we can be very competitive, yeah. you know, and as long as we're in the game, mm -hmm. as long as we're competitive, we got a shot. Yeah. Let's talk about entrepreneurship for a sure. second. Sure. You're both running this and you have your own assets, your skill sets. He does his thing beautifully. Like you said, you do your thing beautifully. You also have a team that has, you know, grown to support this baby of yours. Um, what are the big challenges of running something like this? Because you were talking about being burnt out and being busy. It's very different when you're working for someone else and when you're busy for you and for your baby. So can you talk a little bit about what it's like to run and network and do it, but when it's for you? One of the biggest challenges I find is, uh, and this is gonna probably strike you as very odd, but one of the biggest challenges I find is that you don't have anyone to commiserate with at the coffee pot of the water cooler. You know, when I was at ABC or NBC or Westinghouse or any of the big companies, you know, you, you, you get in the office in the morning and you're talking about the games, you're talking about what was on TV, or you're talking about, you know, whatever. You got people around you, yeah. you know, to, 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 to talk about the business. You know, with what I do in my home office before I hit the streets, it's just me, myself, and I. And sometimes we have an internal struggle. <laughs> You know, um, as a matter of fact, most of the time we have an internal struggle. So um, it's 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 difficult. You know, um, I, I think that when you're really so focused on being the very best you can be, you put a lot of pressure on yourself every day to be to be the very best right. you can be. Um, I, I have an old saying that if I can look myself in the mirror and I can say that at the end of the day that I saw people and I was able to tell my story and, and I was able to get the message of ProView out in the street, stock market's way up. When I don't do that, stock market's way down. It's just that simple. Yeah. It's like, I know you're not a golfer. I'm a big golfer. <laughs> I'm a bad golfer, but I'm a big golfer. They say in golf, if you never get the ball up to the hole, if you're on the putting green, 100% of the time, that ball's not going in. You only have a shot when that ball gets to the hole. Now, forget if it gets past the hole. Right. At least it had a shot. Same thing here. Yeah. You give yourself a shot if you're making presentations, you're telling your story, you're in front of people. You know, and we're in the people business. We're not in the sports business. We're in the lifestyle business. Mm -hmm. We're in the relationship business. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. And so when I can tell my story to you, that's a win, regardless of whether you buy it. 99 95% of the people that I talk to, and I probably do seven, 800 pitches a year, 95% of the people that I talk to say no. Can you imagine? 95% yeah. of oh, the people say imagine. no. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. So it's 5% of the time that the people who say yes, you know, they make this whole thing worth doing. Right. I was just smiling and, and kind of chuckling inside when you were talking about how you don't have anybody to commensurate with. And, you know, I, uh, I never really understood until I became a full fledged entrepreneur. I was financial um, planner for a while, seven yeah. years. And you still, even though it was your own practice, had that. You had the right. office, you had people you can, you know, kind of talk to. Um, it, 
I always tell entrepreneurs, especially when they're launching, know that it's a lonely, lonely world for a while. Most of the time you're either in your head fighting with yourself or you're spending a lot of time alone. And people find that very um, shocking, especially if you're the business owner and you're the business developer. Right. Because like, well, you're always around people. You're always surrounded by all these people. You're such an in, uh, extrovert. Right. Um, and yet, because of that, because we're so surrounded by people, we're actually much more introverted than most people believe. Mm -hmm. Need that time to just process. Um, so I really was chuckling when you said that because I really believe people who are out there maybe considering entrepreneurship have to know that's a part of the deal. You do have to um, know that there are moments when you get up in the morning and you have to really like get out of bed, go do your thing. You know, you have to be your biggest cheerleader. You're absolutely right. right. Uh, and, and entrepreneurship is not for everybody. You know, there are people, I used to knock people that didn't get into their own business. I, I used to you know, think down on people when I first got into this thing and we were doing it and we were successful right out of the gate. And I, I used to think about, you know, when I would talk to other people, I would say, well, why aren't you doing something like this? Or why aren't you, you know, out of your nine to five job? And then I, I, I found out through really thinking about what it is that I'm doing, that it's just not for everyone. You know, everyone's not cut out to work 20 hours a day or do whatever it takes in order to get the job done. There are some some days when I work two hours, there's some days when I work 20 hours. It's not working hard, it's working smart. Right. You line up 10 people in front of me who are working hard and 10 people who work smart. Give me the smart folks any day, any day. Right. So, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult, you know, when the, when the copy machine breaks. <laughs> I even laugh at myself sometimes when the copy machine breaks and I'm looking around for Martha or you know <laughs> Betty or whoever. Hey, come fix the copy. No, I gotta fix the copy right. machine. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, I gotta fix it. You know, or you know when I gotta get the letters typed and I'm looking around. Where's my admin part? Where's my secretary? No, I gotta do it. Yeah. You know, so all those things that you had the luxury of 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 of, of being able to. To, to, to give to someone in a big corporation all those uh, those assignments mm -hmm. that you could farm out so that you could kind of do your job. Now you have to right. do that. You know, it's a whole different deal. Yeah. You gotta be admin, you gotta be salesperson, you gotta run the books, you gotta do all that stuff. All that stuff is your responsibility. You know, and it's not just for you, it's for my business partner, it's for the people that work with us, it's people that work for us because they're mortgages, their light bills, their, uh, 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 their car notes depend on us doing not just a good job, we have to do a superlative job. Right. And let's talk about demographics. Sure. You have all kinds of different businesses that come on board and yep. sign up to work with you, whether they're advertising in the magazine, whether they're doing something with the radio, with the television, or at the events, right? Um, your events are free. Um, but yet, it's a tremendously successful event. Events, it's monthly. Mm -hmm. So, how do you know who to target as a business developer, as an owner of your business? How do you know? Um, do you do word of mouth? Are you actually always studying to see who might be interested? 95% of people are gonna say no. Do you get better uh, by you know being able to kind of decipher who do I go to, or you just go out there and talk, 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 and I used to say if they were 98.6 and breathing, that's the person I wanted to talk to. <laughs> well, you know what? We don't take everybody's business because just like we're not right for every client, yeah. every client's not right for us. Uh, it takes a while, you know, to, to really pick up on that because you're out there, again, you're, it's hand-to-hand -hand combat, mm -hmm. you know. People don't understand about entrepreneurship, going back to that just for yeah. a second. You know, every day is a different day and you're out there with hand grenades, Yeah. you know, and I mean, and, and you just don't know where the, the bullets are going to come from. And so it's hand to hand fighting, you know, all the time. And so um, you're, you're, when you're starting out in the business, you're trying to get as much business as you can. So you're getting business from all over the place, yeah. but every business is not right for you. And so we've been very fortunate in that we have a lifestyle company that reaches a demographic between 35 and 64. Mm -hmm. If you're selling Geritol, 
we're probably not right for you. If you're selling baby products, we're probably not right for you. But everybody in the middle, from airlines to flooring mm -hmm. to uh, uh, camera equipment to uh, makeup, you name it. Mm -hmm. Everybody in that lifestyle area, the baby boomers that everybody wants, we're perfect for them. Right. You know? And again, we're not in the sports business. We use sports as a way to promote our products. And here's what I mean when I say that. The, the, the axis by which everything spins for us is the interview show. Uh, Doc can do an interview with John Riggins or Charlie Taylor or uh, Roger Staubach or, or Gail Sayers or uh, Bill Russell, whoever. These are champions, people who have won a ring in primarily football, but boxing and basketball, track and field, so on and so forth. We chop up the show into four segments. What did the guy do? Where is he at right now in his life? Where is he going? How is he affecting change in the community? And then the last section is the pro's view, where the pro, the champion, right. has an opportunity to talk about guys that are playing today. We don't deal with anybody that's currently playing. When their career is done, right. then they become pro view material. That's one of the reasons why we haven't done Joe Gibbs' show. Because Joe Gibbs is still actively in NASCAR. When he decides to leave it alone, right. then he becomes pro view material. So what we do is we have these great interviews. People that everyone knows all across the country. And if you're a younger person, you look at it, and many of our subjects are people of color. Mm -hmm. People who have won in spite of, not because of. They've come from very, very tough conditions. And they busted through the glass ceiling right. to become the champions that they have, that they become, to, to wear a ring mm -hmm. or to wear a belt. And so if you're a younger person, you look at the show and you say, well, if they can do it, so can I. Mm -hmm. If you're an old codger like myself, you remember what RFK Stadium was like when it was rocking and it right. was moving and the skins were winners or when the, the bullets, the then yes, bullets were right. winning championships and when the, the caps were really doing well. And so it takes you back to a time that was, shall I say, kinder and gentler. <laughs> that's a Bushism. So, um, um, so that's what our show is all about. Right. And so uh, we really reach a demographic that wants for at least a half an hour to go back to a time that was kinder and gentler. Yeah. You know, a time that was a little bit more innocent. And so the products that our uh, advertisers uh, advertise on our show are those lifestyle products that anyone within that 35, 64 age demographic would want to buy. Mm -hmm. Now, unlike most sports products, which are highly uh, highly skewed male, 95-5, 95% male, 5% female. We're about 80-20 on the TV and radio show. Okay. Interesting point here with that magazine and with the events, we're 60-40 female to male. Wow. So it just shows you the broad wow. scope of who we are. Yeah, that's great. Well, I just love hearing all the great successes because it's been a long journey. A lot of a lot of hard work, a lot of sweat and tears. I've seen it. So congratulations on that. A lot of drinking. <laughs> I do also want to touch upon something that I know is very important to you, very dear to your heart. Of course, you know your family is definitely in that category because you are in this place in your life where you that's going to become your priority even right. more so than it is today. But we talked a couple years ago about this love you have and the fact that you have this big dream of being able to travel all over, which you do so well now, uh, travel and speak, but to really mentor and speak to our younger generation, the youth. Uh, so I want to touch upon why that's so important to you to be a mentor mm -hmm. and who mentored you. Well, let's look at it like this. I mean, we're 60% of of all African-American uh, households are raised by a single parent. 60% or better. I mean, it's probably higher than it's that right now. It's probably higher now. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's just abysmal. It's abysmal. How can black folks in this country ever be as great as they want to become when kids come home to one parent or no parents or they're, they're being raised by grandparents or, or the next door neighbors. 
I, I read a statistic the other day that there were uh, there is uh, one uh, DC public school that I'll leave unnamed where thirty percent thirty percent of the kids when they leave the school are going to homeless shelters. Yes. 30%. That's unbelievable. Yeah. So, you know, when you ask about my mentor, my, my biggest mentor, I, I don't have to look far, far for it. It was my mom and dad. You know, I grew up poor. Everybody on my block was poor. Mm -hmm. That's all we knew. We did rent parties, you know. One of us couldn't pay our rent. You know, guess what? We all chipped in and we had food and we raised money and we had rent money. Right. You know, it was not uncommon for me to have my water turned off, my gas turned off. You know, it was cold in the house for a day or two, but you know what? You sucked it up and you, you learn how to eat SpaghettiOs and cold SpaghettiOs out of a can. Mm -hmm. You know, bread and butter sandwiches. Yeah. Oh yeah, cut the toothpaste down the middle. There was no throwing out the, you know, uh, no, no, no. You cut the toothpaste down the middle and you squeeze every bit of it out. You know, I mean, it, it was tough, yeah. tough. I wouldn't want my, well, my daughter now is 36 and you know, my grandkids are, I have two grandkids, 14, well, love of my life, and I have one seven-year-old, and I would never want them um, to grow up, you know, in, in the manner that I did. Um, you know, but it learn, it, it, you, you, you learn how to be humble. You learn how to do without. You learn how to appreciate good things when they're afforded to you. You know, you learn that you can take nothing for granted. Everything in this world is earned, unless you inherit the money right. or unless you win the lottery. Everything you get is earned. Yeah. Nothing comes easy. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. And so, with me, you know, I like to be able to impart that wisdom, whatever wisdom I've learned uh, as as a kid growing up in in tough environments. I like to be able to impart that to kids that want to listen. And again, and Doc will tell you, because he does you know, team building seminars all the time. You're, you're not going to reach everybody in the room. As a matter of fact, most of the kids or most of the most adults, right. most adults, you're going to lose them. But if 20% or 10% or 5% or one person walks out of that room or out of that auditorium or out of, out of the, the, wherever the, the, the hall is, if one person walks out of that room and they get the message and they're impacted and they walk out better equipped than when they walked in, you know what? It's all worth it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to do. What mantra, what words of wisdom do you impart on your children and your grandchildren? Stay humble, stay grounded, stay focused. Be masters in the fine art of yes ma'am, no ma'am, yes sir, and no sir. Fine, that's a lost art. Kids don't say it these days. You know? Uh, manners. Your manners. You know, I mean, do what's right. Do something good for other people. Pay it forward. Right. All those things are, you know, basic. I mean, they sound, I, I mean, I, you know me better than most. And you know that I'm kind of a wild and crazy guy, but <laughs> but at my core, yes. there's a simplistic Midwestern sensibility of what's right and what's wrong. Mm -hmm. And as long as you always know what's right, and, and as long as you don't stay down, not a crime if you get down, it's a crime if you stay down, mm -hmm. you've got an opportunity. You know, one of the great things about this country, and there's a lot about this country that's wrong, mm -hmm. a lot. One of the great things about this country, it is the land of opportunity. Yes. It really and truly is. And so it's not about losers, it's about choosers. Mm -hmm. And as long as you make the right choices in life, you always got a shot. Mm -hmm. Well, we always go pretty deep on the show. And you said it was completely open, fine yeah. to go wherever we're gonna go. So this is something that's near and dear to my heart. One of the reasons you and I really connected as friends beyond just business colleagues is that 
when I met you, you had just suffered a loss, yes. you know, a parental loss, which is the worst of all kinds. Um, I've gone through my own share of losses, including my own father. How does someone in your, um, I would say, career field, being out in the open as much as you are, being in the public eye, uh, constantly having to network and be around people, how do you suffer these great losses and how do you heal? And I want to hear from a guy's perspective because what, what I find with the clients I work with in terms of helping them uncover their greatest gifts and talents, sometimes you have to go through the mud to get it, right? To get them to really explore where they want to go in life. And most of the gentlemen that I work with has a hard time with not being able to deal with grief, not being able to move forward. How have you been able to do that? I really want my viewers who are men out there to have a sense from you that they're not alone. This is a difficult subject. I know it is. Yeah, you know, I lost my I lost my dad um, uh, in 07. And I lost my mom almost a year and a day later in 2008. Yes, I remember. Remember that? I remember. I got the call. And um, you say, how, how, do you, how do you deal with that? Well... I didn't deal with it very well because that was the first time I had dealt personally with loss. I had seen death around me, you know, uh, you know, neighborhood and people I knew and distant, you know, relatives and you know, uh, acquaintances and what, but never death immediate. And I come from a very small family, mm -hmm. so you know, to have my dad pass away uh, in the manner in which he did, and then. They had my mom pass away a short time later, and I always say, you know, the, that you know, my mom passed away from uh, complications of, uh, of, of kidney infection, mm -hmm. but she died of a broken heart. Yes. There's no way that you can be married to someone for over 50 years. 50, 50, I can't remember exactly how many years it was, but it was over 50. You can't be married to someone for over 50 years and not miss them. Yeah. You know, I couldn't even imagine. You know, uh, and again, I go back to my wife, my wife, and I go back to Doc. Um, I can't even begin to thank them enough for what they did for me personally. Mm -hmm. um, and I probably do a very bad job of that. But my wife was there with me every single freaking step of the way. Every step of the way. Doc was there with me every single step of the way. Mm -hmm. And without those two people in my life, I, I don't know that, that I would have made it. And I, and I certainly would not have come through it the way that I did. Right. Uh, just, I mean, just unbelievable. Yeah. And the kind of outpouring and support that Doc was able to, to, to generate through his radio show mm -hmm. for me was just unbelievable. Right. I mean, it's, it's just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. You know, and you just don't find that kind of friendship every day. Yeah. I would definitely say community, friendship, and true connections. People who really get you to the core and kind of stick with you and sometimes not say anything at all, but just be with you. Yeah. yeah. Just be with you. Um, and that also, it's a lifelong journey. It's not like you're over it, you don't miss them, it's fine, you're completely healed. You're constantly missing them. You wish they were here on these special occasions, that special occasion, but life does go on and you have to put one foot in front of the other. You really just have to keep moving, even if that means, you know, pulling the, the sheet over you a, a different way and just turning your body for a day until it gets lighter. Somehow it gets lighter. Well, you know what's interesting? Um, when, my, when my father passed away, I, I remember um, uh, my father passed away in Atlanta, Georgia. My, my folks had relocated from the Midwest to the South back in the mid-80s. And uh, my father passed away. It's so funny. I don't care if I can share this story with you. Of course. Quickly, but, um, uh, they lived in southeast Atlanta for a long time. And a um, uh, single family home. And uh, I, we tried, we tried to get my dad and my mom to move to a, an assisted living facility. Mm -hmm. He would not do it, would not think of it, would not do it, would not have it. Now I know where the stubbornness comes from. <laughs> would not have it. Until one day, just completely out of the blue, he says, well, Mike, 
tell me some more about this uh, assisted living place. I think we're ready. Wow. Just out of the blue. Just out of the blue. You got through somehow along the way, I guess. By then it was too late. Yeah. Because they weren't in that place together right. for, um, for more than six months. Mm. And of course he passed away. So um, uh, it was a very, very difficult thing. Very, very, very difficult thing. My mom, um, something happened with her uh, with an infection in her lung, and then she had some kidney issues. And um, an I witnessed something that no sibling should ever have to witness. I wit witnessed my, my mom pass away in front of my eyes. Um, you know, uh, uh, again, another, another story. You know, my mom had the, the infection she went to ICU and they called me. We had moved her from the south up here to Columbia. And at the time we lived in you know, Silver Spring. And I got the call that uh, she was in ICU. So I went over to Howard uh, County General Hospital to see her. She was in ICU. And this was right when then Senator Barack Obama mm -hmm. was uh, running for office and he made his great speech in Springfield, Illinois. Yeah. And so I went to visit her. She was in good spirits, and we watched the speech. And at that time, you know, uh, for an elderly black person to think that a black man could could run for the highest office mm -hmm. in the land and have a shot to win right. was unthinkable. Right. And um, I remember her us watching it, and she said, "Oh, he's such a sweet boy. He's such a nice boy." And we watched the whole thing, and it was like one o'clock in the morning. I said, "Mom, I said." It, Time for you to go to bed. Right. You know? So I tucked her in, I gave her a kiss on the forehead, and I said, I'll be back tomorrow. And she said, okay. And she, she told me she loved me. I told her I loved her. I turned the TV off, and I walked out. That was the last time I spoke to her. The next day, they said that my mom had had a setback, and they wanted me to come in right away. And when I came in, they had the respirator in her mouth, and they had, I don't know, five or six people holding her down, uh, you know, people with paddles on her. And they had actually resuscitated her. Uh, she had flatlined a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And I'm at the bottom, the foot of the bed, and I'm telling her not to leave me, to hang on, to stay there with me. And then they asked me finally to leave. And then I left and went to the waiting area, and I'm just a mess. Mm -hmm. And the doctor came uh, uh, to where I was, and he said, um, um, well, we got two options. You know, we can continue to do what, we do, what we're doing. And even if she, you know, we can, you know, right give her life, um, she'll be a vegetable because she's lost too much oxygen to the brain, wow. or we can let her go. What a and decision. Said the decision was mine, so I made the decision to let her go. And I went back into, and they, they asked me if I wanted to see her, and I said, yes, I did. And I went back in, and, uh, and again, I was by myself. My wife was on the way, and other people were on the way, but I, for that time, I was by myself. And, um, it was just me and her, and uh, I could see a kaleidoscope of everything that I had done in my life flash before my eyes in about 10, 15 minutes. You know, um, uh, basketball practice and, you know, getting getting whooped is a, <laughs> what it is a, I don't know if that's a real word or not, but getting whooped with a will, we can will switch when I did something wrong. You know, that was at a time where I guess different Different time. Different yeah. day and age. Um, you know, uh, 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 graduating from high school, graduating from college, and birthday celebrations, and Christmas. I could see all of that flash before my eyes mm -hmm. inside of 10, 15 minutes as I said my goodbyes. And that was a very, very difficult period for me. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm absolutely sorry for your loss, and I'm really grateful that you have experienced something that we can share because it's it's very lonely in so many ways when you have gone through pain and loss and not everybody until they live it can truly get it can truly understand when you're trying to explain what it feels like in the process of grieving and such I tell people all the time if you have a parent or a close a loved one mm -hmm. you gotta love them every day yeah. you gotta love them every day See, because just like, what did 9-11 teach us? Yeah. You could walk out of the house 
and we take, again, we take for granted our mortality. Mm -hmm. You could walk out of the house today and that'd be the last day for you. Right. You know, unfortunately, you use a golf term, we don't get a mulligan in life. This is it, yeah. you know? And so if you got a loved one, if you got close friends, you gotta love them every day, mm -hmm. you know? Because you never know when this is your last day. Oh, thank you for that, Mike. You said something earlier about choosing to work to live. Yes. So I want you to explain in the last few minutes we have what do what you mean? The last few minutes we have. I told you it's gonna go by fast. What do you mean the last few minutes? Start the interview. <laughs> I just told you it's gonna go by fast. What do you live for? Well, number one, I live for my family. You know, I live for my family. You know, my wife, my kids, uh, my grandkids. Um, you know, I live for them. You know, um, but I also live for myself. Right. Anyone that knows me, <laughs> anyone that knows me knows I love to have a good time. I love my cigars, I love my scotch, I love my cars, I love my Florida home, mm -hmm. you know, I love my beach vacations, I love traveling abroad, I love living, That's great. you know, um, because again, yeah, this, this, you don't get a do-over. Yeah. This is it. Yeah. This is it. This is, you only got one time on this earth. Mm -hmm. So if you only got one time on this earth, you might as well have fun while you're here. Yeah. Tell our audience how the heck do they find you and have a good time with you. <laughs> you don't find me and you will not have a good time with me. No, that is out. No, um, you can always uh, reach us on uh, www.docwalker.com. Uh, that is our website and you can find everything that you want to know about ProView on the site. It's very informative. Uh, it's interactive. Uh, it's a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun with it, and we hope you will too. Any final words of wisdom for our audience? Live your life. Live, Live your life. life. Be true to who you are. Pay it forward. Great. Thank you so much for being on the show, Mike. Oh, Thanks for letting I me. Want to cry. <laughs> no, you don't. No, I don't. <laughs> Thank How you. How so was your much. tea? It was wonderful. How was your wine? Really good. Really <laughs> no, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to be on the show with us, to, to spend some time with the crew, and uh, it was a delight. I love you, Molly. Yeah, I love you too. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. It's all about the love here, um, and I hope that you tune in next time. See you then.